kind of nervous and excited at the same time. It's an honor to be here. All right, so I just want to tell. You know, I'm really amazed by our age today. Like, we're in the digital age. And to be honest, I'm really amazed how advanced technology is. And, you know, all the inventions and stuff, you know what I'm saying? So, one of that is social media. And we all know this is very self-evident that, you know, most of us have our own social media accounts. We, you know, and there are so many... And for example, you know, these are just some of the things we do, you know. We use an application to book a grab, you know, and we listen to music, stream movies, and, you know, watch YouTube videos and Jericho say, oh, joke. And, you know, we can actually find pertinent information for our research or whatever the heck you want to do. We have Google Scholar. We can even order things online. And, of course, we could FaceTime our loved ones, our relatives, our enemies we, we could like hey how are you guys so you're in dubai and all that stuff and of course these are just some things you know uh, and there are endless possibilities we can do in social media and i know you already know this you know social media has been part of our lives maybe it has changed our lives in some way to some extent but i am here today in front of you to tell to tell you how social media changed my life Right, so a little background about myself, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, when I was young, I didn't know what to take. I was one of those kids, you know? So when they asked me, what course do you want to take, anak? I don't know. I don't know, to be honest. So, you know, I asked guidance from my parents. You know, I asked wisdom. So my mom told me, well, you can take business, uh, business management, you know, because your aunt owns a school. So when you finish that, you can help and all uh, all that stuff. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna take up business management. And then boom, I took it and failed. Right? I failed. So I was devastated, but not really because I didn't know really what to do. So my mom told me, okay, might as well take this course, educational psychology. Because again, your aunt, my auntie owns a school. And you know, okay, I'm gonna take educational psychology. And then boom, I passed. I'm like, yay. So I, I did it, and then, of course, I went to college in De La Salle University. And, you know, one of the major challenges I've encountered was, you know, me going away from my family and, you know, staying in Manila, you know, in the dorm, talking to my uh, dorm mates and all. That was a major adjustment I had to make. It was really difficult. Secondly, of course, the, the culture there. It was different, you know, all the language barriers and, of course, the academic standard. I was not smart. I am not, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, I'm insecure with my classmates. They're like articulate, they're smart, they're amazing, you know? So, I was, I, I really felt like I was a misfit. I, I struggled with my academics. I was, I was struggling with a lot of things and, of course, academics. I felt, a mis I, I felt like a misfit and then I told myself, what am I good at? I, ha I, I don't have that thing that I can say that oh, this is mine, you know what I'm saying? I didn't have that. So what I did was I tried basketball. You know, I, I, basketball back then was my passion, but really it was more of a distraction uh, that I needed to distract myself from the harsh reality that, you know, I was struggling with a lot of things. I was jack of all trades, master of none. And, you know, I told myself, maybe if I trained hard, I might land myself in Team A, and then from there play UAAP, and from there play PBA, and then from there live a good life, Gucci gang. I was so innocent, right? I thought it was that easy. But deep down, I, I knew that was impossible because I was already 17 years old back then, and I was... I was not even good. I can't even dribble, you know, with my left hand good. It was like, what's up, man? Basketball. But I, <laughs> deep down, I really knew that it was too late for me. But still, I was in denial. So I pursued basketball. Ball is life. So there came 2016. A that was April, if I'm not mistaken. It was early, and, you know, my friends asked me if... I wanted to play, and then I'm like, okay. I was coming from Pampanga that time. So I took the first trip, 3 a.m. I arrived at Manila, 5 a.m., and then I was getting ready to play. 
So literally, just after a minute passed, hindi pa ako nakakashoot. I stepped on another person's foot and then boom! I tore my meniscus and I injured my right kneecap. And it was painful. It was painful. It it was excruciating, you know. And some some of the people were laughing like, Ang ginagawa mo? Parang... <laughs> So it was painful, but what was more painful was the fact that my dream, I literally felt that my dream was rejected. You know, this was the only thing I was, you know, grasping. This was the only thing I was loving, you know, and then it was taken away. I literally felt like it was rejected by life itself. So, it was one of my darkest moments in life. I know it's petty, but... This time, I was really down. I was devastated. I, I didn't know what to do. But I believe that what seemed to me that what seemed to me as a rejection, it was more of a redirection. Of course, I can only say this because I'm already passed through it. But, but at that time, it was really dark. It was really, it was really uh, painful. But the, that that pain, that discomfort, you know. As hard that is, as it is, it led me or it forced me to put things into perspective. What was more important back then? And I was forced to focus on what's more important, hence my studies. And this time, it was already thesis season. And as aforementioned, I was struggling back then in my schooling. My first two and a half years in LaSalle was crap. I hated it. I was always homesick. By, by the time it was Thursday, I was excited to go home on the bus and reminisce about life. <sighs> Bad trip. So, while I was at that dark place, I literally was forced to focus on what's more important. Long story short, Pop, I was given a second opportunity by life to finish strong. Next, Pop. So I believe in the saying that it's not about how you start, it's about how you finish. So finish strong. Long story short, po, I was given an opportunity to do well in my thesis, you know, and you know, we defended our thesis well in front of you know, masters and PhD of my mentor. He's, he has his own class. And I, we won an individual award about you know, innovative teaching stuff. So I was really overwhelmed that despite my mediocre start you know there's a redemption in this story but in my case i had to be broken i i felt like i was a stubborn kid chastised by life because i was stubborn you know i know everything <laughs> but i had to be broken down and in the darkest moments as hard as it is i'm not romanticizing it but it is true that when you're at the rock bottom there's the power within i believe in that so i i I finished strong and I'm thankful. But at this time also, when it was thesis season, it was very stressful. I had to do something to, you know, distress myself. So that's when I started to vlog. And I had my intention was just to ruin people's day on Facebook. Just just it, you know. I didn't know that it was going to be something in the future. Now, it was therapeutic for me because thesis is really stressful plus my partner and my mentor are very smart. And I'm like I'm, I'm very heartful. <laughs> Puso, ganyan. So, by this time, I graduated. And then, I decided to stop vlogging as well because I lost my motivation, to be honest. Like, no one's really watching. It was just my parents and my mom's angry pa. So, okay, I'm a quit. And I decided to teach after graduation since my course is related to, you know, teaching. So, I, I decided to teach. And for the first time in my life, you know, well, my course says that teaching is okay, but for me to personally experience it, you know, I respected the profession of teaching in a, in a heavier weight. So I, I taught, and my first month of teaching, my mom told me, oh, Anak, you do this content. I was back in Pampanga, you know. After graduation, I went back to my province. I'm like, what's this content, ma? You know what I'm saying? You do this uh, kapampangan. Like, okay, whatever. By this time, I already quitted vlogging. But, you know, just to ruin people's day, okay, let me have that. Let me check. And this was literally about 
Kapampangan. Things about kapampangan. I did it. I shot it using my iPhone 6. I edited it using my iPhone 6. Posted it on Facebook. And then the next day was where my life changed. You know, next book. It became viral. And, you know, I'm like happy. Like, whoa. Famous. I'm just kidding. I'm not. I'm, j- I'm just joking. Humble. I was overwhelmed, to be honest. Like, it was the least content I'm expecting to go viral. Because who likes kapampangan? Us, kapampangans. We don't even like ourselves. So, <laughs> it went viral. Well, more than this, it sparked something in me that made me want to know more about my roots, my culture, my kapampangan roots. So, for eight months, I continued to, you know, talk to the kapampangan old heads, the traditionals, the lenient, and everything, everyone. And for eight months, I used this platform to tell the younger Kapampangans that our culture is dying, it's something to be proud of, learn about it, don't just use Tagalog in English, also use this and all that stuff using the vlog format. Expo. And I was surprised because truly, you know, if you know Casey Neistat, a very famous filmmaker in the States, he told in his video na, you only need three things, you know, a camera, well, a phone with a camera, a good idea, and a good Wi-Fi. We have a problem with the Wi-Fi. Anyway, I really hold on. I really held on to that because I didn't have money to buy expensive ring lights. Hey guys, welcome to my YouTube. Channel. I didn't have that yet. I only have these things, and I really, you know, I really used what I had. And to be honest, it was was effective. Next book. So for eight months, why did this kapampan content? And a local TV show told me, na, hey, if you wanna. You want to host a Kapampangan themed local show? I'm like, wow, it's an honor. Of course, it's my honor to, you know, to host. But, you know, hosting is another platform. And so, it was for two seasons. The first season I hosted by myself, and the second season I was co hosted by, by that girl. So, while I was overwhelmed by the new, you know, new thing that I was ventured upon to. Tama I was thinking, what's next? I couldn't stay with Kapampangan. I have to evolve, right? It was eight months, puro Kapampangan. It was full of Kapampangan content. I had to think of something that, that's new. Hence, um, there was this time when, you know, Gilas Pilipinas players, basketball players, they had a brawl with, did you know that? And I had the burden to, to just say my two cents. You know, this is my two cents. And then it went viral. And then I spoke about a social issue about content creation, about toxic Filipino culture, crab mentality. And I used our theoretical framework to, <laughs> to, to use it. And then I, I was surprised that it's, it went viral. And then people are starting to support. And the messages I've, uh, I, I'm getting were really overwhelming. Of course. There's also hate. Now, speaking of hate, of course, as much as power, as much as social media is powerful, you know, it can impact people you haven't met yet. You know, you can inspire just making a video. You know, you, 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 even, you even see the messages that, you know, it's really life-changing. But there's also this other side, which was the hate comments. Next book. Now, I didn't expect this because everything was very new to me. Everything was really, really new to me and I didn't know how to handle it. First off, the negative effects that I've um, encountered was I became addicted to social media. It became, a, it's like a digital cocaine. You know? Early in the morning, it's the first thing I check. It's mechanical already. And of course, secondly, I... I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook always. Of course, this is part of my job. I have to be updated with what's happening. Although, you know, an influx of negative things, you know, sometimes I can't calibrate it anymore. Sometimes, even when I put the phone down, I still take those things with me to sleep. And it affects me in some way. Thirdly, the criticisms, of course. I mean, that's inevitable. There's criticisms that are good that you can use for, you know, take in the good, put out the bad. There's also bashers that, you know, just want to ruin your life. So, of course, 
I know the cliche na, don't notice them. Just don't notice them. But that's so hard when you're actually in the position that you're being ridiculed, you're being crucified. And you, you have, you know, it's, it's really hard. So that led me to become anxious. That led me to be crippled by fear. I was afraid. This was, this was just recent. And I decided na I was almost at the point na I, I just want to stop making videos, you know. If, if this is the package. I didn't, they didn't tell me that I have to face this. So, while I was also at that dark moment, I had to step back, reevaluate why I'm doing my videos. Am I doing this for fame, for clout? Or am I doing this beyond myself? So, I was, I was really thinking. Then I had the chance to check my messages again. And then, that was the best moment for me. And I've read some that brought me back to my purpose. You know, when you read, you know, when, when you encounter some kid, you know, as young as 10, 11 years old, and they're a lot, they're gonna tell you some stuff that's hard, that's hard to read. And even myself, I find myself not replying because I cannot, I don't know what to say. I'm not an expert in life. But all I can do is listen, you know, and at the end of the message, they tell you that the reason why they're fighting in life, the reason why they're holding on, the reason why, th why they are smiling despite of pain is because of my videos. And while I, was the, I, while I was at my darkest moment, it, it hits home. It reminds me that this is my why. Hate is inevitable. Hate is inevitable, but even if there is one kid out there, one person that is being changed, then I do this till the day I die. Criticisms are inevitable, to be honest. But I'm learning to not please people anymore. I'm learning to do this for these kids, for these people that are out there in the dark. Next book. Lastly, I just want to end by this quote, with this quote by Lecrae. You know, I really admire this guy. If we live for people's acceptance, we die from their rejection. And I, I started to resonate with this topic because truly I was slowly becoming a people pleaser and I was, I, I was becoming, you know, I, I lost myself but I realized that I don't need anyone's acceptance and you don't need to because you're already great. You're already great. And we all need to use this, our light, to inspire others. Now, I just want to end with this. A social media is a powerful tool. And there are a lot of things I'm still learning today. But I just want to say what I've learned is that use social media wisely. Don't let it use you. Thank you very much. Thank you.